Amen. Now, December has been consecrated to reflecting. You know, I'm, I'll have personally the days running to Christmas because we change gears. We are not into uh, every song is good as long as it praises God, but some of them are very uh, complicated because the beat is fast, uh, the volume is high. You don't know what the singer is saying, but you are jumping. Yeah, which which is good, you know. To jump is good because we lose weight. But at Christmas time, we digress in speed and we increase in reflection. We think through what, or we think through what we sing. What is the meaning of the song? What is it that you're think, thinking, thinking about? Then the whole thing moves into one person. Christ. And I'm excited in church when we don't praise the weather, when we don't praise the angel, when we don't praise the air, whoever, but we focus on the reason for the season, Christ. And then we begin to think, how does Christ interact with our lives and how does he affect us? critically important. And that's why we've decided to take a series of teaching on touching incidents around the birth of Christ, which we began to explore already uh, some weeks ago to just see how does one who was with God became one of us. Because that's, that's the story of Christmas. Christmas is basically the one who is with, was with God became one of us. God became a human to walk the planet Earth, to do certain things. How do we react to that? So, the first thing we learn, which is critically important, that every time heaven invades Earth, there's a huge disruption that brings unexpected complications. That was the story of Joseph. Joseph is in love with a young girl. They've gone all the way, spoken privately, spoken as family, paid something to hold it, and then all he's waiting is the consummation of the marriage covenant when the unthinkable happens. The fiancé who claimed to be a virgin is pregnant. How do you explain the pregnancy when you know no man? Every time you call yourself a Christian, there will become a time in your life where unexpected complications will come. How would you react? Is the story of Christmas. Well, there are many ways. You can go by the letter of the law. This is how life works, this is how we react, this is how we do things. Or you can choose something better, the law of love. Let me listen to love more than logic. But I propose to you, if you stop by the law of love, you're still missing one thing bigger. It is submission to the will of God. That is Christianity in its best light. I don't get it. I don't understand. It's hard on me. It's tough of me. But if God, that which you want to do, brings glory to you, so be it. That's Christmas story. So therefore, when December comes and December will go, 25th is around the corner next week or radio the week that follows, uh, we will be in this room. Celebrating Christ. But when the curtain closes, the question I have for myself and for you, will you do the will of God when the will of God doesn't please you? Will you submit to the will of God when the will of God goes contrary to your own advantage? 
How about if the will of God inconveniences you? Will you still say, not my will, your will be done? That's the spirit of Christmas. Christmas has nothing to do with this beautiful stuff. I love them a lot. The red boxes, they make, they work. The snowy white, they work better, even if it's summer. <laughs> everything on a stage is so staged that the glittering light, everything around is telling you, Christmas, chicken, 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 meat, chicken. Let's go and party. Swim even if we cannot swim. Yes, but the spirit of Christmas is submission to the will of God regardless of the price and inconvenience. Somebody give him praise. Come on, somebody give him praise in the highest place. And then Christmas interacts with us again around favor. That's the second thing we learn about when God invades earth. The one with God who became one with us when it comes, not only disruption comes in the human life, demanding for submission to the will of God, but the second thing, it is favor is readily available. But favor is a problem. The problem with favor is many times when God's favor shows up, it's not favorable. When favor doesn't look like favor, what would, what would you do? Well, let me talk to you a little bit about what you've been talked to on Sunday. Remember Elizabeth? That's the story of many of us in this room. That despite of your love for God, your weekly fast, your meditation of the word before you open your mouth to speak to anybody, you have decided to speak to God first. Despite of all these exercises that you do, you are still barren in certain areas. <laughs> How do you explain a God of miracle who gives babies to people who don't want babies, deprive people to the people who are praying to him every day for babies? But you see again, when God speaks to us at the level of God, we have to crank up our Christianity to go to that level, otherwise we miss it. Because we heard, God is not in a selfie, God is in a movie. Huh? Can I have some amen in the church? Because when you see the life of Elizabeth in year one, Year two, year three, or four, or ten of marriage, you will go with a conclusion that God cannot give babies. But the Bible says, he who was said to be a barren had a child in an old age. As long as I haven't breathed my last, my story is not finished yet. Come on, give somebody. Somebody give him praise in the highest place. Hallelujah. Miracles can still happen before the very last day of my life because that's the nature of favor. But you see, there's an Elizabeth who is dealing with favor in a very difficult way, but there's a Mary who's dealing with the same favor in a complicated way because favor comes with a package of Shame. Oh, my word. Am I preaching to somebody today? Yeah. Have you lived for the rest of your life with a reputation that is not true about you? Ha! Yeah. Huh. I'm reminded of Mualili, who said when Jesus was proclaiming and writing down, people said, we are not illegitimate children. Reminding him, even if you think it's a family secret, we know all about your mother. 
she got you out of wedlock when she was already married to someone else. Ah, you are very young. That's why you are quiet. Because Christianity is not lullaby and kumbaya. Christianity is sometimes to do the Jacob thing, blessed by God, changed to Israel, but limping for the rest of your life. Because God touched you. Favor sometimes is not favorable. Because the packaging is different. Today, all of us, when you look in hindsight through the rear mirror, we see the Australian evangelist with that limbs. We all think it's so cool to preach to millions. But this boy, his dad and mom were pastors. What do they think when you fast and pray? Preach to other kids. Preach to husband and wife. They give birth to normal kids. And then when your child comes off the womb, there are no legs, there are no arms. Hmm. Come, come close, come close, come close. Let's talk. Today, you know his name. You kept reminding me the name. Nick. Today, Nick is the talk of the world. You want to be Nick's friend. But put yourself in Nick's parents when Nick was a baby. Oh, it's, it's better to praise when favor has finished his job. <laughs> but when favor is unfolding, it doesn't look like favor. It doesn't look like favor. But still, God's hand is upon it. What do you do? We were taught the only way you deal with favor it is you walk in righteousness. By receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior, but by also deciding to do it the Bible way. That's the spirit of Christmas. Christmas calls us to submit to the will of God. But Christmas calls us as well to live lives as God has designed life to be lived. When you do it, you have celebrated Christmas. But today I want to take you to another journey. Probably the most important about touching incident. It is God's work. When God is doing stuff, because that's the reason why the Bible is the Bible. We come to church. We open this book. The reason we open the book of the Bible is because God is busy doing something every single day. Genesis 1-1, when you open, in the beginning, Elohim was doing something. When you close your Bible, Revelation 22, at the close of the chapter, Elohim is coming. And through the two activities of Elohim, God works nonstop. That the question I'm asking you, the question I've been asking myself through Christmas, why is God busy doing something all the time? Do you think God cannot still sit still? He's so afraid of quiet that he has to be doing something? No, no, no. Stay with me, stay with me. There's a bigger reason. Throughout the ages, every time you see God's activity in your private life, in your family life, there's the point to this one major truth. God wants you to change his view of him. Come on, give him praise. 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 Somebody be alive today. Every activity of God throughout time is pointed to one single spiritual and theological truth. God wants you to have a view of God that is correct. 
Because if your perception is not correct, your perspective is out of work. And when your perspective is out of work, your behavior changes. Who is God to you? How do you see God? So you see, the first job of Christianity is to have the correct view of God. That's why Jesus came. <laughs> the heaviest and mightiest work of God was the coming of Lord Jesus Christ. The reason why Jesus came and walked the planet Earth is for people to see God finally in action among men. Elohim became Emmanuel, God among us. So that our perception of God can be changed. But you see, God is active in life for a second big reason. For you to change your attitude toward life. I've said it many times. Many people have said it also before me and after me. Your attitude will always determine your altitude. You never go up in life beyond your mindset. Your view of God affects your mindset. Your mindset affects what you become in life. But three, the reason why God's activity is throughout time is to solicit a response from you. That's Christianity. Listen, listen to me. Friends, if Christianity is only philosophical debate, we are not different from the devil. Oh, let me try. I, I will have a Christian on this side. If our Christianity is based on philosophical debate, you are not better than the devil. Because the devil can theorize stuff about God. James says he believes that God is. But he cannot practice the ways of God. Therefore, crying in church doesn't make it anymore. Falling on the floor is not good enough. And Christians are good at crying. The question is, many times we don't know why you're crying. Could be a reason totally disconnected to worship. Hallelujah. What am I saying? Christianity that do not translate into practical living is not Christianity. So Christmas, the mass of Christ, the gathering together to celebrate the one Christ can only make sense when after we have gathered as people there is a result in a space of a practical life that reflects Christ. Your view of God, your attitude toward life, your response to God. That's why God does what he does. That's why the Bible is a book filled with God's activity, nothing else. The theory of God talking is very, very minimal. Many times it's just God does, God does, God does, God did. God will do, God does. The reason God is in the business of doing it for you to begin to see God and read God differently, it's for you to begin to change your mindset, it's for you to begin to respond to God in a certain way. Let's talk about it. Turn with me please to Luke chapter 1, verse 46. Elizabeth has just greeted a cousin and everyone is so, so touched by what Pastor Oliver preached last Sunday. But let's see how Mary responds to the greeting of an old cousin who was six months pregnant. Verse 46 going to 56. Would you read with me please if you don't mind? One, two, three. No, 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 no. You are not, you are not, you are not fair. The early service had less people. 
and they read very well. And the second service, you have slept longer <laughs> with more people. You should do better. Let's try and read in English and read it loud. One, two, three. Thank you for reading. What a story. Elizabeth is six months pregnant when Mary rocks up. The pregnancy is only at the beginning. She's embarrassed. She's, she's just ashamed. And through divine wisdom, God says to avoid pressure that you cannot handle, go uphill to Hebron. And then she moves up. Now, where she stays, Bethlehem is a very uh, funny place. It's downhill, it's, 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 it's gossip field and stuff, and then Hebron is the highest place in Israel. You have to keep going up. And every woman in this church has been pregnant. You know that pregnancy, the first quarter, is the toughest one. Because of all the changes that comes your way, the spitting and the vomiting, the fatigue, the being angry at your husband for no reason because he's the cause of your misery. All these things are going on, but Mary doesn't have a luxury to be angry at her husband because the husband is the Holy Spirit. Oh, oh, suki, suki. Who do I preach to? Because the tough time is in your life where you know what is going on. It's not fair, but you cannot take it on God. She goes up, and as she reaches Elizabeth's home, Elizabeth greets. That's last Sunday, preaching. John the Baptist, who was only six months, jumped in a mother's tummy because his excited cousin, king, and savior is here. And then she says what she said, from now on, <laughs> favor being upon you, uh, you will be blessed among all women. I'm not feeling blessed <laughs> because I've just ran from all men because of the stigma and the reputation. But now, let's talk, let's talk, let's talk, because I'm, I'm your guest speaker. Do you know that as we sit, I can prophesy with precision that there's a Mary in this church? Somebody with a Mary's name right now. <laughs> if I want to have a 100% accuracy prof prophecy, I just stand and say, the Lord is telling me there's a Mary. There is a chance there's a Mary. 100%. But tell me the name of the gossips of Nazareth or Bethlehem. Herod was in power. What's Herod's wife's name? Who has ever given to his child Herod's wife's name? She is blessed. <laughs> tell your neighbor, don't take a selfie. There's a movie unfolding. 
Come on, if you believe in your movie, come on, give him praise. Come on, give him praise. When the Lord tells you you are blessed, you are blessed. Huh? Now Mary's singing. She's singing. A purpose of her poem is to help us understand the nature of God. What is he saying? She says, number one, God is the sole source of true and lasting blessing. If ever there's a blessing, there must be a blessing of the Lord. When the Lord blesses you, you are blessed. No, no, let me try again until I have a Christian on this side. When the Lord blesses you, you are blessed. Listen, never confuse blessing with a house. Because you don't need to be born again to have a house. How oh, many unborn again, hell-bound people have many houses that they can't even count. Never confuse blessing with a car. Mary said, I'm blessed. I am blessed. Because the packaging seems to be controversial now. But the one who blesses me can handle anything. That there will never be a woman in this life who will ever be popular enough for girls to have the name Mary. Mary Sally. Mary Jan. Mary whoever thing it is. Listen, I've traveled a lot. I have never seen a parent give to a child a name Jezebel. <laughs> Say, I love my daughter so much, you're Jezebel. Because there are some names that God has not blessed. <laughs> oh, let me try, let me try this side. Let me try, maybe I will have a Christian. When the Lord blesses you, even your name becomes popular. Amen. Huh. The, there are people who will talk about you without knowing that it is you. Just allow God to touch your life and see what will happen. Now, Ma Mary says, the reason why I am 100% sure that I'm blessed and the only source of true and lasting blessing is God, it's because number one is the Lord. Oh, you don't get it. Let me try again. He is the Lord, which means he owns everything and everybody. That's Psalm, 100, uh, Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord, and it's full of health. The world and the people who live in it. Therefore, when the Lord wants to get something to you, God doesn't need to sweat. Oh, I will follow where the anointing is. <laughs> Somebody says, come on, I'm coming. <laughs> Listen, the Lord is so good that when he wants to bless you, if it will take for some people to die, so be it. Now, you don't get it. You don't get how the Lord works. There are some children who will never suffer. All it takes is for, for God to take home their parents. This is come Sanye. Your dad said, well, after his death, it's yours. All you need is the son. Don't kill me now. I still want to be alive. I'm not looking at certain people I'm just looking for. Because when the Lord blesses you, he makes other people work to prepare for you to inherit. It might not be now yours, but it's still yours. And the, the, the converse is true. When the Lord curses you, he makes people have gone before you to get into debt so that when you, they die, you begin to pay for them. Oh, the church is quiet. The church is quiet. Somebody say amen for me to keep preaching. Amen. It's abnormal for parents to die and the children to begin to worry how to pay off debt.
Why did I leave before my children? For me to leave a mess. I don't want to be controversial. Let's go back to blessing. The Bible says, the blessing of the Lord. <laughs> come on, somebody, help me preach. Come to me, come to me. The blessing of the Lord makes rich and many blessings can make rich, but there's a sorrow part. <laughs> well, we wish to be president, but not with Zondo. I sat on a seat that burned my behind for the rest of my life. That's not a blessing. <coughs> the bigger the house, the bigger the trouble. It's just people don't hear you when you cry. I think we should return the American Indian behavior. Back in the day, whoever wants to be a chief, they say, we don't have an issue with being a chief at one condition. You have to sit on hot coals. You are our chief, but you have to burn your behind. You sit and you burn your rule. You want to go for the second term? Sit again. In the Indian tribe, nobody ran for two. <laughs> because they knew by the time I finished my third term, there would be nothing to sit on. Oh, come on, somebody give him praise. Somebody give him praise. But when the Lord blesses you, <laughs> there's no sorrow. I maintain it. You know, I'm not bragging but I'm bragging. <laughs> For you as parents to go with children, to reach this age when they have their own children, and to be problem free, no jail time, <laughs> there must be God. To walk them up here and collect a trophy of a husband and wife? Man, <laughs> that's the blessing of the Lord. For them to go home to wherever they are without them following you all the time, Dad, can you send me because you're running out of nappies? My word, that's a blessing. Our money now is our Come on. Have you been in a condition where the children are gone but they are not gone? Because now it's more problem. They are gone with their children. Now it's parents, wives, and children coming back to you. There are many ways God blesses you. There are many ways God blesses you. Oh, let me talk, let me talk, let me talk, let me talk. You have to see God as the sole source of true blessing. For you to sleep in bed, be intimate with your wife, with a conscious knowing there's nothing in me that defies our relationship, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. Because some of you, you will be sleeping with your wife or thinking about Susie. Let's talk, let's talk, let's talk. Come, come, come close, come close. Come close. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. He had no sorrow. I have no time to take mama's phone to scroll and see who is calling, who she's calling, or who is calling. It doesn't exist in a home. Not because you are angels, but because the Lord put his hand on us. Listen, listen. For people who think I grew up in church, you are mistaken. I was a gang guy, a drug addicted, an alcoholist, a womanizer all the time in nightclubs. 
But for God to reprogram your mind, that's a blessing of the Lord. That's a blessing of the Lord. That's a blessing of the Lord. That's a blessing of the Lord that makes rich had no sorrow to it. I grew up in a family where sorcerers were eating people. I have never been eaten. It's a blessing of the Lord. I can write, walk into the homes, eat food, drink even the remain of the sauce. I'm fine. Because I'm unbewitchable. Oh, come on. Come on. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. Mary. Mary singing. Mary, she's a teenager. There's hope for you grown-ups. If a teenager can get it, you can get it too. But don't live all your life trying to chase after blessing. Hold on to God. Hold on to God. Hold on to God because God is the real blesser. To have you as a family, it's a blessing of the Lord. I can pick up a phone and people will leave a home at midnight, one o'clock, because daddy needs me. I can stand and say, hey, gang, the house is burning down. Do something. You will go and empty your bank account to save the day. What a family. The blessing of the Lord. 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 The this young man came to my house, fixed the old gate for free, paid his own money. The gate I went to check, it was going to cost me in excess of 20000 and plus. He did it for free. Why? When the Lord blesses you, son pays the price. Come on, come on, come on, come, come to me, come to me, come to me. Let's keep talking. Let's keep talking. If you don't honor God, that when Jesus came, real blessing showed up. You haven't understood Christianity. Don't chase after the next shoe. They always lose the glow. Remember when you brought the green ones? You thought you have arrived. Until they lost the spark. Now the new suit that you bought on Black Friday. Is pushing you to combine with the blue shoes. Green doesn't work anymore. Because nothing of this world works forever. Amen. Oh, let me talk, let me talk, let me talk, let me talk, let me talk. The blessing of the Lord. Let me talk. Proverbs declares, love the wife of your youth. You don't get it. Let me preach again. Love the wife of your youth. The Bible doesn't say, love your youthful wife. Let me try. <laughs> love the wife of your youth, not your youthful wife, because when she was young, now she's old. Every year that you go with your husband and wife, something falls apart. Believe me, I used to have six pack. I tell you the truth, I'm not lying. God is my witness. Six. For real. Plus the two extra. Eight. I used to. I used to finish training and have my t-shirt on my, 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 my shoulder. Go bare chest for people to see. You can count one, two, four, five, six, seven, eight. But now, but now, but now, you cannot count past one. You go one, one, you go one, one, you go one, one, because things change. Ha, ah. ah. ha, somebody give him praise. The blessing of the Lord, the blessing of the Lord makes rich and add no sorrow. Every time a guest comes to a house, even the most 
a cute and astute observer, her confused with mama's picture. They go, this is Geraldine. This is so-and-so. I go, no, this is not Geraldine. This is mama. <laughs> because the Lord says, fall in love with your wife of your youth. Because if God doesn't bless you, every new model will trouble your mind. And they come every year, brand new on the market. What do you do when the new models are coming all the time? Oh, tell your neighbor, Merry Christmas. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. The blessing of the Lord makes rich. My soul praise the Lord. My spirit rejoices the Lord, my Savior. Number two, what Mary wants us to learn, that God is always acting for his people. Even when it doesn't look like God is doing something, he is. Huh? Mary said, he is the Lord, but he's my Savior. Ooh, suki, suki. Huh. He is the Lord. There are people who will bow to the Lordship of Jesus by force. Some of us have bowed willingly. But bowing, you will bow. But in terms of saviorship, it's by choice. Mary is carrying the baby. She should have said, I am the savior of God because he was in trouble. Look what I've done. I have given him my home so that he can come. But no, Mary, when she sings, she goes, he is, he is my savior. Because God, when he comes to your life, he gets you out of trouble. But the second thing Mary is singing, he said, this mighty one, he has been merciful to, oh my God. Can I, can I preach to somebody on this side? I need some Christian. The mighty one is not just mighty. Because the mightiness of God has to do with his position in the universe. But his mercy, it is his capacity to love me enough to find me as I am. But never leave me as I am. Oh. Oh. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. The work of God. Find me as I am. But never leaves me as I am. I will tell the story I told in the early service because it was a good story. And it's good because it's my story. Let me tell you my story. That is a good story. That I told in the early service... And it was good because it's my story. <laughs> and this is how my story goes. When I was a child and I grew up, I got a nickname. But not that nickname is unusual. Many people are tonton, titi, tante. You know, those are normal nicknames that you give to someone when you're bored to call them a long name. You just go tinti, you know. But my nickname that I got when I was a child was petrol. <laughs> Let me try this side. I used to be called petrol. Now that I have your attention, may, let, let me tell you where petrol came from. Petrol came from a short temperedness. I was so quick to blow my fuse that when you do something wrong to me, before you breathe, I'm on you. Before you know it, blood is running. My old mind was, I have to hurt you so that you have a scar that stays longer for you to remember me. You don't mess up with me. I got the name Pedro. When the Lord found me, I was still Pedro. But his grace never left me Pedro. 
God took me and made me a cucumber. <laughs> Could come collected. For you to rattle my world, you have to be determined to do something wrong to me. Otherwise, stuff don't bother me. How can God change petrol into cucumber? Because God works for people. Because God works for people. Let me tell you another story. Because it's a, you know, 10 o'clock service for people who sleep late. Let me tell the story. How did God use his ways to change me? It's 1981. I've just met a friend with a lady at her work. And then a lady has a friend that I've never met. And it's lunchtime. We, we're talking with a lady friend of mine, colleague. When her friend, whom I'm seeing for the first time, came. And he found me bragging about my petrolness. That I am short-tempered. You, you mess up with me, you're in trouble. Man, I was so messed up that I went to look for Muti to beat people. That's how bad your bishop was. So what am I preaching? Before you mess up with me, remember what I used to be. <laughs> so, so that you change your mind. <laughs> All right, it's, it's my way of terrorizing you. Let's come back to the story. Let's come back to the story. And I'm bragging to this lady about how I, got, I get angry quickly and I do stuff. And the guy is listening to me. And he's older than me. And he goes, you cannot be bragging. Now he gets my attention. Because he said, every time someone brags about his being short-tempered, what he's preaching to us is still immature. Because anger is a sign of immaturity. Come, come here, come here, stay with me. That day, 1981, I decided never again somebody will call me immature. The only way is for me to not be angry anymore. God has ways of working for you. <laughs> he can use even a first time visitor to change your mind. Mary goes, this grace, it found us as we are. But it never leaves us as we are. It changes us. If there's a church that understands the grace of God, it's Rama. 24 nations in one church. We don't board, we don't worry about who's who. We are just brothers and sisters. Hugging and kissing. For some of you, kiss is the first shock because you've never been kissed. And then there comes someone in Congo, Brazzaville, or Cameroon and go, mwah, mwah. You go, whoa. Uh, <laughs> Before you laugh at these people, let me tell you a story of hugging because if you think hugging is cool. I'm in Durban. Nobody have ever got hugged me before. And I went to a white church. To make it worse, it's a lady. She hugs me. And I'm going, oh. <laughs> no, 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 in Jesus' name, no. Because I'm thinking Jezebel is here. Temptation has come. And for them, they're just innocent. They don't understand the kissing, but they understand the hugging. We don't understand the hugging, we understand the kissing. And when the Lord works for us, we do both. It's even better. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, give him praise. Come on, give him praise. Come on, give him praise. Mary goes on. Say, hey, hey, hey. God is not just the sole source of your true and lasting blessing. God is not always working for you, but the number three thing God does that she sings in a song, God is always turning society structures upside down. Somebody give him praise. <laughs> Meaning what? Your future is not set in stone. Today you can be an employee. Tomorrow... <laughs> 
Tell your neighbor things do change. Let me get you to where you can understand the preaching. Do you believe that Mandela grew up like any other child in Kunu? Playing in the dust? Who gave chance to the guy to be the most biggest icon in our generation? Do you believe that Mbeki, when he was growing up in the hills of, of you know, Eastern Cape, was a normal child? Who could thought or could think that Mbeki will be president? Do you believe that Zuma with a primary school certificate in the Kozulu Natal in Kandla, could they become a president? Who would they believe that the child from Limpopo in a Bavenda tribe called Sweden will be president? Your story is only known to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody, if you believe in God, give him praise. Come on, if you believe in God, give him praise. Hallelujah. Your story is only known to God. Never ever think that someone is more than you. Don't turn the temporary into the permanent. You are renting today? Society doesn't tell us that people who purchased, purchased the last house. Let me try. Maybe I never christened this side. You are still renting? The last house on the market is not finished yet. Yeah. Geraldine is doing a matric. Every parent who have grown the child to a level of matric, and especially if it's your first daughter, it's emotional. It's season to get into exams. The landlord comes from Durban to Cape Town. He comes not to visit, but he comes seeking for me. And he finds me at my house with my wife and my children. Geraldine is preparing for a matric. He stand at the door when I open for him and say, Mr. Chalo, pay my money now. I go, can you greet him? Let's go outside. He say, no going outside. I need my money now. Did I build this house for you? <laughs> now my wife is listening. My kids are listening. You don't know how to tell the guy for the sake of my dignity because you have no dignity. <laughs> I did what no man should do in the presence of his wife and children. I went to my knees to beg the landlord to not kick me out of the house until my daughter finished her matric. She goes, you are out. And he banged the door. I'm embarrassed on my knees in front of my wife and children. We have to leave. We left. My brain doesn't know how to think and process this thing. And I tell my wife, let's go. We start walking hamlessly to try and find a place we can rent because exams are about to come. Be careful when you think things are going well for people. I kept preaching the same way every Sunday. People didn't know what I went through. We knocked at every door. There was no house available. I'm at a loss. The little money that you're paying, I could not afford it. That's why the Indian kicked me out. And I crossed the Cape Flat and I went to the southern suburb where the whites are. It's more expensive. And I'm looking for a house. And I found this house in Audley Street. And I knocked at the door with my wife. And I tell the white guy, I want a house to rent. The guy says, I put it on the market because... I'm headed to Durban, and I need a good tenant. Back in the day, there's no black in that neighborhood. Zero. Zero in English, proper zero. You know, the English zero, not the spiritual, proper zero. 
Then as you talk and you want to probe and know what, who I am, he end up knowing that I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor. He happened to be also a pastor of this church down the road, Vineyard. You know Vineyard? He was the senior pastor back in the day. Of course, he was my colleague. Shake my hand. I sensed the anointing coming upon me. And he goes, you know, because you're a man of God, a man of God, we don't need to go through, you know, a via, uh, you know, state agent. We can just sign the contract. Pay me. I found the rent money today, this morning at four o'clock. We were paying five thousand and eight hundred rand in that suburb. We moved in. God could not pay two thousand, but now God is paying five thousand. Maybe the Lord knows you don't mess up with white. I don't know. He start paying. <laughs> and he start paying regularly. Huh? And then the guy, out of the blue, six months down the road, he calls me from Durban. And he goes, hey, Charlo, you know what? I've made up my mind I'm not going back to Cape Town. I want to put you to the market. But before I put you to the market, I wanted to honor you first. If you want to buy, feel free to do so. Now hold on to your chair. When the Lord wants to change things, He changes them brutally. Yes, yes. They put the house on the market with the money we didn't have, but we had God. As you are thinking through how to go about to get the money, two brothers from the same family came at different time to give us enough money to buy the house. Yes. Now, when the Lord gives you the first house, it means the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the fifth, sixth, and it just goes. Huh? I used to rent. Now they're renting. Because tell your neighbor, hey, my condition will change. <laughs> Come on, give him praise. Come on, we'll give him praise. Come on, we'll give him praise. A village girl, now her name is blessed. Everybody knows Mary. But number four, Mary sings in the fourth and last stro strophe of her song. That God is consistently faithful to his covenantal promises. That when the Lord tells you he will do something, is as good as done. Hello? When darkness comes, the song told us, don't forget what the Lord told you when there was no darkness. Every Christian life is based on one truth. God said it. We are praying and preaching in what God said. There was a time we didn't know if the church will survive. Because we needed copper money, two cents and five cents, to pay rent. Here we are. In what God said, there were church plantings with 44 congregations spread around the world. You were sitting here. Did the Almighty God told you anything about your future? Trust me, it will come to pass. It will come to pass. It will come to pass. Time will not permit us. We were living in a tiny little house. Windowless. When the Lord spoke to me for the first time, I remember that day as the glory of God came as a ball of fire in that room. 8 p.m. 
For some reason, my wife is sleeping early that day. God comes. She doesn't know that God has entered the room physically. That's the first time I'm knocked on the floor. And I pray in almost every known language from 8 p.m. to 2 in the morning. Some people don't mess up with them. They've met God. They've met God. The reason why my energy for God has never gone down, I met him. The reason why paying price and sacrifice for God is good for me, I met him. Because in that ball of fire, God spoke to me that you will stand on every continent to proclaim my word. I will take you to the highest institution of, of uh, learning and you will teach classes. And I'm looking at the windowless small rooms. Four decades almost later, I stood on every continent to preach the gospel. I entered into the Ivy Universities to talk because when God said, it's as good as done, did God tell you anything about your life? Be okay with it. But you can go through it limping. We have collected names, magician, sorcerer, all this it's part of the package. Jacob became Israel, but he limped until he died. Mary became the mother of Jesus. The stigma is still on her to this day. Are you going to be afraid because of some stigma? I have to protect my reputation. I have to pro you don't have a reputation. Jesus had a reputation, and yet he came. How do we close this talk? Because for some of you, now you're being bored with my testimony. <laughs> I know you wanted me to testify how I'm a failure, how it didn't work. Sorry to disappoint you. Because with Jesus, it works. Yeah. It works. It works. It works. It works. What is the attitude that Mary is displaying and want us to display. One, if you know that it is the Lord who's doing all the stuff for you, be humble. Hallelujah. Amen. Be humble. One of the trouble that God has with his children, some of them are too arrogant to be blessed by God. Would you tell your neighbor you are not God? <laughs> no, 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 no. That neighbor doesn't have any anointing. Speak to the other one. Say you are not God. No, that neighbor doesn't even have an anointing. Speak to the one behind you. You are not God. <laughs> now, none around you is anointed. Speak to yourself. I am, not God. I am not God. Meaning what? However many degrees I have, there's still an aspect of life I cannot master. Amen. However amount of money I have, there's still something that I cannot do. Humility is the mark of people God is going to bless a lot. And pride is a sure statement that this person will never go for. Number two, your attitude should be of gratitude. Be thankful. All I do in my life in telling my story it's just to say, he helped me. And I'm happy and grateful that God helped me. Hallelujah. This is something I've learned about ungrateful people. Whatever you do for them, they will always find something to complain about. Yeah, you know, the food was okay. The food was okay. Once someone you invite at your house said the food was okay, never invite them again. <laughs> it's not yours. It's not your house. You didn't spend on money. I'm doing it for you, and all you can find is okay. <laughs> because you see, the level of salt. Ah. Well, Thank you for inviting me to your church. Uh, it was so-so. 
So, so, do you know what it takes to preach? No, 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 let me talk to you. It's tough to preach. If you doubt, can you come replace me? <laughs> and do the conclusion. Your, your legs will shake. Your blood pressure will go up. Your mind will be fried. Every, looking at you in the eyes, and some of you, you are specialized in terrorizing preachers. <laughs> and I have to preach past you. And believing and hoping that it's working. And they go, so, so. Because an ungrateful person, even when you change their nappies, they will still find something to complain about. Number three, don't just be grateful. Mary said the third attitude, you have to have renewed hope. Every day, the Bible declares his, his mercies are new every morning. If it didn't work today, there's still tomorrow. If you didn't graduate in December, there's 2020. My wife will tell you, she's on vacation, you know, she was fatigued. Mama, go rest and just let me deal with them. <laughs> My wife will tell you one of the biggest blessings she got by marrying me. She got a guy who is full of hope. Regardless of what we face as a, as a couple, I will repeat to her, let's sleep. We will see tomorrow. She's always surprised. How can you sleep in the midst of trouble? And I got my wife, trouble is already here. If I don't sleep, I lose double. <laughs> trouble and sleep. So I have to be smart. Win on one, lose on the other. Let me win on sleep. Actually, anybody who knows me, the more I sleep, the more I'm in trouble. My mind just goes into sleeping. Because at least when I sleep, I don't think about you. When I wake up, okay, your memory can come. But when I sleep, and God have graced me with sleep, Senzo, when I sleep, you can take me to Durban, I will not know. <laughs> that I will sleep. And I sleep at will. That's another blessing. I guarantee you now, if I tell you in five minutes I'm sleeping, I will sleep for real. I just go boom, gone. Because I, remember, I just, I'm reminded. Hope is the only strength for Christians. God is in the future. God is doing something. God will fix it. God is wise. God is smart. Jesus came. All is well. Let's finish. What should be your response? Your response is very simple and very easy. One, praise him. Hello? Tell your neighbor, praise the Lord. That is what God expects. Mary starts a song with a simple word. My spirit. Do what? Magnify the Lord. Make him bigger. Huh. My spirit do what? Have you ever seen a magnifying glass? Yes or not? If you haven't seen, please, you know, get one. When you take a magnifying glass and you put on a hand, does the hand change its size? No. The hand is still the same hand, but what changes? Your perception of... And, and, and Mary, this is what praise is all about is to magnify the Lord. God will never become bigger than who already is. 
But when you put a praise magnifying glass, you begin to count your blessings. You begin to go, I might not have a house, but I have my legs. You begin to see stuff, you will jump into praise. That's the spirit of Christmas. When God is at work, he wants you to go humble. He wants you to be hopeful. But he wants above all, your life to be characterized with praise. And finally, the second responsibility, proclaim his mighty works. That's the spirit of Christmas. Talk. Nothing more, nothing less. God, you are so good to me that you bless me, God. God, you are so good to me that you worked over time to bring me to where I am. God, you are so good to me that you turned my situation around. The mighty became weak, the weak became strong. God, you are so good to me that you gave me a promise to hold on to because my future is bright. Because it's your doing, I have nothing I've done to deserve it. I can only be humble. But I will not stop at my attitude. I have decided whenever I go to church, whenever I'm in my room, whenever I am somewhere there, my mouth will praise you. I will make you big in my head. But two, I'll tell someone that you've been good to me. Churches don't grow because Christians don't tell that God has been good to them. When last did you tell someone about the goodness of God? And why did you tell? Would you close your eyes and bow your head? As you sing, your grace has found me just as I am. Empty-ended but alive in your hands.